Well, hello, hello, hello. Jane Hogan here, the wellness engineer. Welcome to Wellness by Design today. We are talking to uh, David, Dr. David Hanscom, and we're talking about how to, um, about anxiety and how it is actually the driving force behind chronic disease. And of course, with my audience, we're talking a lot about chronic pain. And um, so there, there's this link between anxiety and chronic pain. We're going to redefine anxiety, though. But first of all, I'll tell you a little bit about David. So David, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> and to be here. Yeah, I'm thrilled to have you here. It's really interesting. Your background, you were a back surgeon. You were doing back surgeries until you realized there was a better way. And now you uh, you have a, a couple of books out. So one is Back in Control um, a, about the action plan on how to uh, reduce pain. Um, and then also your latest book is Do You Really Need Spine Surgery? Take Control with a Surgeon's Advice. And so this is really interesting. I, I find it really intriguing that what you used to do and what you train for, uh, you realize now that it's not really the right solution and it's not really getting at root causes. And I'm all about root causes. It's, it's the foundation of functional medicine, but I mean, it just makes sense, right? We want to get right. at root causes. So let's talk a little bit. First of all, I mentioned uh, that you really define anxiety in a different way or just kind of reframe it all together. So let's hear a little bit about that first. So what I learned is that <clears throat> I'm a major spine surgeon and I was fearless. I would, could, my attitude was bring it on. I can take on anything. And what I eventually learned as a master is suppressing stress or suppressing anxiety. I actually did not know what the word meant. So mm -hmm. when I was 28 years old and a patient admitted with, with an anxiety disorder. <clears throat> and I had to go to the textbook to look up anxiety. I did not know what it meant. So what was happening though, is I was so good at suppressing stress. I didn't really feel it. Again, my attitude was bring it on. And then in 1990, I was driving across the 520 bridge in Seattle. I had a panic attack. So I went from no, honestly, no anxiety to a panic attack. And after that panic attack for the next 13 years, I developed crippling anxiety. So I thought anxiety was psychological. I went to psychotherapy for 13 years and I'm not against psychotherapy, but I did not realize that anxiety is a result of stress. It's not the cause. So we keep thinking that stress is psychological, but stress is just a threat. It could be a bully, it could be a teacher, bad boss, finances, et cetera. So we find out that threats create a reaction in your body that we call fight or flight. And humans have a word for that called anxiety. So anxiety is just a state, <clears throat> just a description of your body's chemical state of what you feel when you're feeling danger. So anxiety is a result of stress. It's not the cause. So I thought it was the cause, and I kept putting it on the left side of this chart. I had the input, the nervous system, and the output. And it turns out anxiety is the result. So your body, every living creature has a two basic survival mechanisms. One is to stay alive for another day. The next one is to pass its DNA on to the next generation. Those are our survival mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that every living creature avoids threat and gravitates towards safety. And humans have the same issue. And the issue that's so critical, critical today is we want to get rid of the word anxiety, and just simply call it an activated threat physiology, activated stress response, whatever you want to call it, your body's in fight or flight. So again, that sensation, anxiety is just a description of that neurochemical state. The key mm. issue I, I is- just, I'd like to just interject there, just kind of talk about how that reframe is so critical that it's not a mental thing at all. It's a physiological response. Correct. And that changes everything because right. then you're going to approach it in a different way. So right. let's hear about that, David. Well, I want to make one comment is that this response, your unconscious brain, where you eat, walk, talk, blink your eyes, digest your food, et cetera, is very complex. Mm -hmm. They've counted this in, a, in in different ways, but they estimate that the brain processes between 20 to million bits, 20 to, four, 20 to 40 million bits of information per second. Wow. And the a powerful brain, computer. Well, it's incredible. I mean, look at every living creature. They hunt for food. They avoid danger. They're, my cat, for instance, just fascinates me because she's so quick. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have consciousness. She's not thinking about, you know, another cat. She just simply reacts really badly to another cat. This is automatic. 
So this survival reaction is very powerful and the conscious brain only processes 40. So you can't, we tend to think of anxiety as something to be shunned, to get rid of, to calm down. But from an evolutionary standpoint, if you think about this logically, it's intended to be so unpleasant that it forces us to take, forces us to take action to survive. It's always going to be unpleasant. The species of creatures who did not pay attention to this cue simply did not survive. Mm -hmm. So the creatures that are alive today of any species, but particularly humans, is survival actually of the most anxious. Hmm. Right? I mean, from evolution evolutionary standpoint, this is not intended to be a pleasant sensation. So you so I do want to talk about psychology just for a second to define. Okay, so humans have a major problem called consciousness. <laughs> and why, why would that be a problem? Well, we have language, and I know animals probably do have emotions. We know that. <clears throat> they have their own physiological states. But humans have language and thoughts. And we have concepts and abstract thinking and art. So we have all sorts of things that animals don't have. So it turns out there's a woman out of New England, Lisa Feldman Barrett, who has documented that consciousness is as much of a reality as this chair or table. In other words, our th thoughts and concepts of life become embedded in our brain, and that is our version of reality. And since we're all programmed so differently, our realities are so different, each human being is actually infinitely different. So the problem with consciousness is that we have unpleasant thoughts of threat. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, we don't like those thoughts because they create a physiological response. So thoughts are sensory input. They create a fight or flight response. So unpleasant thoughts are input or danger. It's sensed the same way in the brain as a physical threat. And then we have the same physio physiological response, except humans cannot escape unpleasant thoughts. We know that. And it gets even worse because when we suppress negative thoughts, as we know, we try not to think about something, you think about it more, but there's also a documented trampoline effect. We think about it a lot more. So you have these unpleasant thoughts coming in. So thoughts are sensory input. That is the psyche, right? That is our consciousness. That is our psyche. So I'm not saying psychology is no factor here, but emotions are what you feel. So if you're on the beach drinking a beer, your body chemistry is full of oxytocin and dopamine, and all these pleasant chemicals, you feel great. And we're full of adrenaline, inflammatory molecules called cytokines and histamines, all these inflammatory proteins, you feel anxious. So again, anxiety is a physiological state. Safety is also a physiological state. So good food, good wine, good friends, play, contentment are also physiological states. So again, your psyche comes in as a threat or not. And since humans, since every living creature is programmed to survive, your consciousness always goes towards the negative, right? Right. That's <clears> to ensure survival. That's what we're supposed to do. Anyway, let's let that settle for a second. I know I covered a lot of territory here, which <laughs> I'm trying not to cover too fast. But my main message is here, look, anxiety is not a psychological condition. It's a physiological state. And we're going to try to use the word for the rest of the program of just an activated stress response. So stress mm -hmm. is not psychology. It's the threat that says danger. By the way, the threats, the, the stress that's the most stressful is the stress that you can't control. Right? Right. And that one of those stresses are your thoughts. You can't control your thoughts? Nope. <laughs> Some people would say that you can control your thoughts. No, there's a lot, a lot of research on this. So have you heard of this? You've heard of the thing about don't think about white elephants or whatever. So yes. I mean, there's, there's a very famous paper written in the 1990s. Actually, it's gone on for a lot longer than this. But we all know when you try not to think about something, you think about it more. So it's called the White Bears Experiment, published in 1987 out of Harvard. So they had these college volunteers ring a bell every time they thought about a white bear. And when we try not to think about a white bear, they ring the bell way more often. So there's a tremendous trampoline effect of suppressed mm -hmm. thoughts. But we also know that if you suppressed thoughts, it actually shrinks the hippocampus of your brain, the memory center. It actually shrinks your brain. There's actually a higher chance of opioid addiction with suppressed thoughts. That's what got me in trouble. I had a great practice. I had, it was, you know, being a spine surgeon is stressful, but I could do it. But I was such a master at suppressing these thoughts. And then I went on to develop what's called OCD, an obsessive compulsive disorder, 
which appears to me become a more more common issue, and it's magnified by intense, repetitive, obsessive thoughts. And the harder you try to get rid of these things, the worse it gets. So by 1997, well into this whole process after my panic attack, I was getting multiple panic attacks. For some reason, I was able to, able to do spine surgery. When I was so focused on spine surgery, it sort of crowded this stuff out. And then clinic was the same thing. But eventually towards the end, I couldn't even get through clinic without every three to five minutes of some crazy thought that became more and more visual. And as I'm talking to people, this is a very, very common problem. And I was suicidal. I could not escape these thoughts. Mm -hmm. So there's multiple anxiety reactions, multiple reactions to them. And remember, when you fight something, you've now given it more neurological attention and you've reinforced it. So, you know, seven years into this thing, I was absolutely desperate and I was actively suicidal. I have 20 medical colleagues actually dead from suicide. And when I look back to Adam and call them and talk to them, and actually I watched this happen, some of them very closely, it's a self-critical perfectionistic voice that doesn't stop. It just drives you right into the ground. So physicians are perfectionistic by nature. Mm -hmm. We're also well-intentioned. And so it's a neurological trick, but it's, it's very, very prevalent. I'm getting emails every day from people all over the country talking about these obsessive thought patterns. But when people think about OCD, they think about hand washing and stuff like that. I had what's called internal OCD, <clears throat> which is thought, counter thought. I do not have any external manifestations at all. And we think, you know, there's this TV show about the hoarder syndrome, which is also OCD. It's kind of a joke. I'm telling you, this mental pain is the worst aspect of the human existence. There's nothing mm -hmm. like it. And connected to physical pain. I mean, it's the same thing really, isn't it? Well, it's interesting. I have, I had, <clears throat> okay, so the essence of all chronic disease is sustained stress physiology. I believe that. It's, been docu believe it's that. documented hundreds of papers. We've known this for decades. Mm -hmm. So I won't go into all the research on this, but again, it's not psychological. Your body's in fight or flight. It's like driving your car down the freeway in second gear. It's going to break down. So it turns out cancer, heart disease, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's are all inflammatory disorders. Um, autoimmune so, disease, I'm, uh, I'm assuming. Autoimmune, irritable bowel. I had 17 different symptoms at the worst part of my deal because what happens, your mental threats translate into stress physiology, which translates into physical and mental symptoms, by the way. So it turns out anxiety, depression, OCD, bipolar, schizophrenia are all inflammatory disorders. They are not psychological. They are all physiological states. Mm -hmm. So again, the psyche is the input or the thoughts. And it turns out with OCD, uh, so the prognosis for OCD is very poor, by the way. So cousins to it are eating disorders, hair pulling, nail biting, um, body image disorders. All those are obsessive disorders. And when I say anxiety is the driving force is that avoiding threat or avoiding danger is what keeps us alive. So we're trying to pull anxiety out of the diagnostic coding system. So look, it's the driving force that creates a lot of psychological, I'm sorry, creates a lot of behaviors that are psychological diagnoses, but it's a driving force. It's not the right. diagnosis. So there's lots of addiction. And there's lots of diagnoses that come, that come out of it. Mm -hmm. But the thing we call anxiety is actually simply stress physiology. And, and what, what do you know from your experience like doesn't work when dealing with this because we tend to think of it most people tend to think of this as a psychological thing right. and so the tools used most often are psychological tools and and so do they work or do they not work or what does work well let me just remind the listeners again that your unconscious brain processes about 40 million bits of information per second your conscious brain processes 40. So it's a million to one ratio. So what doesn't work is talk therapy. It doesn't work. Understanding your past in detail doesn't work. So what we've learned is that anxiety is a gift. How, how, would we, how, long, would, how long would we survive without anxiety? So it's powerful, it's protective. Again, a million to one ratio. So the key issue, you learn to separate from it. In other words, we get, we get our identity wrapped up in this survival reaction it feels bad. You feel ashamed. There's all sorts, all sorts of thoughts come into your brain. Remember, the emotions are what you feel. So if you're in fight or flight physiology, you don't feel very good. And then mm -hmm. so remember, 
anxiety causes you to take action to survive. But if you're trapped, your body kicks in more of a stress response and you become angry. So anger and anxiety are the same thing. It's just a matter of degree. Right. So I call anxiety a activated stress response and anger is a hyperactivated stress response. So it's your last ditch effort to escape. But again, we have all sorts of threats. We have poverty, authoritarianism, racism, financial conditions, homelessness. Those are really bad physical threats, which I do not want to dishonor that suffering. That is a terrible thing. So, but those are threats. And one of the risk factors, by the way, for chronic disease are these situations socially that, that are a problem because your body's under threat all the time. It's yeah, hard, it's socioeconomic as well. So that's a massive problem. So on top of that, this the number one threat still are your thoughts. So even though your, your consciousness is only a fraction of your unconscious brain, it still activates your unconscious response. Mm-hmm. So again, I had 17 different physical and mental symptoms. I had anxiety, depression, and OCD. I had migraine headaches. My ears were ringing. My stomach was a mess. I had neck pain, chest pain, back pain. My feet were burning. These skin rashes popped up all over my body. How's that psychological? So people say, well, and I went to doctor after doctor. I'm a surgeon, so I had lots of access. So I had all sorts of diagnosis put on me and I did not understand what was going on. Somehow physicians are not trained in this stuff. And there are thousands and thousands of papers that document the same thing. Mm -hmm. Symptoms are created by your body's chemistry. So there's a diagnosis out called medically unexplained symptoms, MUS. And I'm sure some of your, some of your listeners have had this diagnosis and it could not be farther from the truth. Everything's wrong. Mm -hmm. Every cell in your body is now bathed by inflammatory proteins your brain's inflamed, your nerves are inflamed, and you have all sorts of things happening in your brain that are inflammatory. Your metabolism or fuel consumption is elevated. You're actually cannibalizing your tissues. Early arthritis, et cetera, are from ongoing stress physiology. Your immune system's compromised, i.e. cancer. So the literature shows very clearly if you have a certain amount of stress, it's called the Holmes stress scale. And you have positive and negative stresses with the number one stress being death of a spouse and then death of a child. Those are all given points. If your score is 300 points or more, you have an 80% chance of a major disease within two years, 80%. So one of my colleagues had a score of 463. Guess what? He has cancer of his spine. Wow. And you have watched this happen and start looking at your, unfortunately, we have lots of friends and family that have passed away but look at your lives around the time they get sick. So again, death is not psychological. Skin rashes, migraines, stomach issues. Your body is reacting to ongoing threat, i.e. Mm-hmm. thoughts, but also other threats too. So in medicine, you know, I'll, I'll rant about medicine just for a second. So remember, you have the input or your stresses. You have the state of your nervous system or your coping skills. Then you have your physiology. I call it the input, the nervous system, and the output. Love that. So with the doctors, we're treating just the symptoms. So if yeah. you come to if you come to me with a stomach ache and I give you some medications and you, you're going back to a work situation where you have an abusive boss or a spouse going to jail or, or whatever it is, when your stress is overwhelming your coping skills, you become sick. So in medicine, we don't talk to our patients anymore. I don't know who you are. I don't know your coping skills. So we call it dynamic healing is that the root cause is the interaction between your stresses and your coping skills. So trying to solve your problems with just treating symptoms, is like trying to put out an oil well fire with a garden hose. We're not Mm -hmm. treating the root cause. So again, how do you treat the root cause? And I'll just give you sort of a hint here. There's ways of remember the stresses that are the most stressful are the stresses you can't control. But there's ways of processing these stresses of actually just minimizing the impact on your nervous system. And for instance, one classic example is called expressive writing, where you can't escape your thoughts, but you separate from them. That's one tool. Mindfulness, we go from racing thoughts to a different sensation. Huge one is forgiveness. Mm -hmm. If you're holding on to something from the past, obviously your brain doesn't know time. So that person might be right in your... The person you really despise might as well well be sitting right next to me. (laughs) 
<laughs> why do I want that person in my life today? I don't like this right. person. I don't have to like this person. So input, like we ask our patients when we leave the room, never discuss your pain, medical care, no complaining, giving advice or criticism ever because you're firing up your physiology. Right. So that's the input part. Yeah. That makes, makes a lot of sense to me. And for my own journey too, it was, it was emotionally stressful events. You know, a year later I end up with RA. So I knew, I knew that that was kind of, it was related to this stressful emotion. That's why to me, taking the medications didn't really make sense to me because I'm like, well, I'm not really dealing with it. I got to like figure, figure this out. Right. Right. Um, and so I'm, I'm so thankful because it actually took me to all this work that I'm, that I do now. And I just love the simplicity of this message that you're sharing with people that it's the, it's the physiological restaurant re response to stress. It's, we are creating proteins of stress within right. our body exactly. and then our cells are just responding to those proteins of stress. Right. Because, well, that's what they're bathed in. Right. And so we, we need to change those proteins of stress. So you're talking about a few strategies on how to do that through um, expressive writing, through mindfulness, um, through, uh, like I would imagine, breath work. It's what I teach a lot of. And that helps with that, you know, present state awareness. So those are some great ideas. Um, and I know you've got a whole process. You want to talk a little bit about your process? The, it's called the DOC, right? It's called DOC, the DOC journey, direct DOC your own journey. care journey, right? So um, it represents a C, it's an action plan. So you can read my book and nothing's going to change. So you can read mm -hmm. a golf book, nothing's going to change, right? Same thing with the piano book. So just look at this as a learned set of skills. So it's called, it's at the DOCjourney.com. And I wrote a book called Back in Control, A Surgeon's Roadmap Out of Chronic Pain. And so... Um, it's my journey out of pain, but I didn't know the neuroscience back then. So the doc journey reflects the modern neuroscience. It and it took me a long time to realize anxiety actually is the pain. In other words, pain is just a signal. You know, too hot, too cold, too bright. And so in a day when you're coping well, these pain signals may not bother you at all. And other days they bother you a lot. There's that physiological state. So I want to say one comment, like breath work. So what breath work does is actually not psychological. You're stimulating, you actually are stimulating the vagus nerve, which is powerfully anti-inflammatory. Now, I didn't know that. I should have, I should have remembered that from medical school, but I didn't. And so to me, like mindfulness, okay, I'm going, whatever. I'm a surgeon, right? What does mindfulness have to do with anything? It has everything to do. Because again, you're going from racing thoughts to a different sensation. So again, it's called dynamic healing. There's ways of processing the input. Let's take the nervous system. So diet, anti-inflammatory anti -inflammatory diet is very powerful. Um, exercise, very anti-inflammatory. Sleep is huge. Mm -hmm. There's more correlation of pain and disability with sleep than there actually is with the pain. Then the other thing is trauma work. If you come from an abusive background, we call it a high A score, adverse childhood experiences, you're like a feral cat. And so mm -hmm. psychotherapy doesn't fix that. What does fix that, we call it somatic trauma therapy, yeah. where it's very challenging to take somebody, I mean, it's challenging to tame a feral cat, right? So a lot of people are so emotionally traumatized, which makes me crazy, because why do we do this to each other? Whole different topic. <laughs> but I mean, if you're, if you're raised in a chaotic background, which I was, you, you weren't raised feeling safe. So why would you feel safe now? So you have to just tease people back to life. It's called somatic trauma therapy. And there's a bunch of ways of doing this, by the way. But again, what doesn't work is talk therapy. Because I just thought if I just understood my past enough, it would solve the problem. I did not know how to calm myself down. So the essence of all this is actually the essence of chronic illness and disease, including chronic pain, is sustained threat physiology. And so you learn the tools actually to process the physiology it's always, anxiety is always going to be there. This happens multiple times a day, every day. You just learn, okay, I'm anxious and I'm triggered. Again, my body's protecting me. Then you learn how to process it so you minimize your time spent in stress physiology. 
But the real healing comes in, and I'd love to get your take on this, is nurturing joy. <laughs> right? Love it. Because, but you can't, since it's a million to one ratio, if you're using activities to distract yourself, it doesn't work. In fact, it shows that living life in a hedonistic manner is actually inflammatory because <laughs> it's a way of suppressing your anxiety and pain. So you have to feel the pain, process it, and let go, and then you can move into this other realm. But, you know, good fine, good food, good wine, good friends, all those things put your brain into a different spot. Altruism. Mm -hmm. Giving back is actually anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. Social connection. Just being with people secretes oxytocin, which is a social bonding drug, which is, again, anti-inflammatory. 53% of Americans are socially isolated. Mm -hmm. It's the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes per day. Wow. So if you're, again, going out with your friends to distract yourself, whatever it is, I think I call it, when I use the word spiritual journey, that means just bringing back perspective. But when you're fighting off anxiety and anger, I lost my perspective. I think a lot of people lose their perspective. And I think maybe in a different podcast, we can talk in detail about these obsessive thought patterns, but they really take you out of the present moment. Yeah. So there's a lot of layers to this, but in general, I guess my message today is anxiety is a gift. It's protecting you. It's supposed to protect you. It's supposed to feel bad. Otherwise, it wouldn't be protecting you. So what you do, you separate identity from this physiological reaction. We call an activated stress response. And there's a bunch of ways of doing that. And then as you move into your new life, people thrive at a level that you cannot imagine. So I created a sequence called the DLC journey. It starts with just, under, just some basic skills to start calming yourself down. And it goes into anxiety, awareness, anger, and then sort of nailing it down. We also have an app called the DLC Journey app um, based on our workshops, which were shared pleasant connections. And in three to five days, essentially everybody came out of chronic pain in those three days. Amazing. After, after, but but it was they were connected. They were laughing. Yeah. My wife's a tap dancer. She happened to be the star of the show. <laughs> and it, But play is a, I mean, play is probably the ultimate safety state. So it's threat mm -hmm. versus safety. As you, as you spend more time in safety and less time in threat, you will heal. I, I love love that. Remind us again what the DLC stands for. Um, direct your own care. So it's about 90%. So, so here's the deal. So it's not a self-help process. It is a framework that allows you to organize your thinking. So you get some foundational steps on board. And about two-thirds of people heal just with the journey. And about a third of people, we add on, we add on trauma therapy or relaxation tools or right. EMDR, different things. But it gives you a nice foundation to start. And then again, the app does the same thing and is very self-directed. So you don't need a big pain clinic. Um, it's been really, well, I quit my, I quit my surgical practice to do this because I've seen so many people badly damaged by spine surgery and so many people healing with this. I just could not watch it anymore. Amazing. David, I feel like, of course, we've just like you know, done the tip of the iceberg on on this topic, and it's I really appreciate how you um, really simplified and gave us the big picture. So thank you so much for that, and I'd love to have you back again down the road where we dive in a little bit deeper on some of these topics. But for now, um, uh, we've got to wind up a little bit. But I want to ask first of all, because this show is about intentional living. Because I believe that's how we can heal. We can't sort of do what we were doing before mindlessly. We got to do something differently. So what would you say in terms of what's one thing someone could do today that's going to really change their health? Just a baby step. Um, I would start with the expressive writing. There's over mm. 1,200 research papers that says that it works. It doesn't, you cannot escape your thoughts, but you can separate from them. It's just an exercise. It's I put a PDF together that's really quite available um, to explain why expressive writing is so effective. Um, I It's hard for me to believe there's, it was the one tool I had that started the process after 15 solid years of trying everything was expressive writing. So it's, it's not the solution, but it's the one necessary starting point. Yeah, I love that. And I my mother used to say this, and I believe it now, when, when your thoughts are in your head, they seem like they're so much bigger because they're in a small space. But when you right. can get them out, 
Right. They don't seem so big. Even, you know, talking about something with a friend, like if you can really let it, let it go, then it doesn't Except seem to, as I, big. I, I, I know, to, I know what you're going to say. <laughs> it's not no, the same as right as the, your own thoughts. Well, no, here's the thing. We actually really, really, and I, I learned this at our workshops. We really ask people to never discuss their pain ever with anybody, period, ever. Ah, interesting. Because okay, your, your, your attention's on the problem, not the solution. So it actually- You're then, right. Right. And so it's, it sounds, it's a big deal. And we all do it. I did it. And that's what the piece of paper is for. So you you write down your thoughts and you tear them up. You tear them up to write with freedom, number one. And number two, as you write all these issues come up, they're not issues. They're just thoughts. So it's a very simple exercise. It's extremely powerful. My skepticism is still, how can something so simple be so powerful? But again, reverses rheumatoid arthritis, reverses autoimmune disorders, and decreases the viral load in HIV. It improves student performance. I mean, the things that if it actually improves wound healing. After surgery, people heal twice as fast with expressive writing because for some reason it's anti-inflammatory. So good. And, and, and I love that what you said there about um, tearing it up afterwards, because that really gives you freedom to just yep. kind of say whatever right. and not worried about, will someone read this or whatever you write it, you tear it up. Cause you don't want to look over it again because that is reinforcing the problem. Right. So well, all these issues come up and again, they're not issues. They're just thoughts. Right. And if you want to analyze them, then you've actually reinforced the problem. Mm -hmm. So, so th there's a process of just empirically and dispassionately processing anxiety and anger. You're going to be there every day. They are gifts. And then you, it, it's a, you know, learn, it's a learned skill to nurture joy. We're not really taught that either. Mm -hmm. So that's my personal challenge is I'm used to fixing, 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 doing busyness, busyness. And one of my mentors really challenged me hard about six months ago about nurturing joy. But that's where the healing actually occurs as you move your brain into that part of the mm. arena. It's a long way from pain circuits. Mm, so good. So where is the best place that people can find you and get this gu the guide that you've got for um, for expressive writing? Where's the best place, David? So it's called The DOC Journey. Um, that's the basic action plan. My book, Back in Control, is on Amazon. And you'll see in the book, I have a website called backincontrol.com that has like 600 blogs on it. It's a little unwieldy, but people do like to wander through it and just take a look at it. That PDF is available there. I also blog for psychology today. So my blog just hit a million views this week. And so there's lots, it's all about anxiety. It's called anxiety, another name for pain. So that's on psychology today. Oh, wow. And it's just hit a million views. Congratulations. Yeah. No, thank you. I'm going to look that up. David, thank you so much for being here today. Being yeah, a guest thank on you. Moments by Design. I'm really excited to share this with people because I know it's like, True healing comes when we get right at the root causes. And I appreciate what you've shared today. So thank you so much for being here. And thank you to the people that were watching and listening. I know we had, I didn't even get a chance to uh, mention what Margie was saying. She left a few comments for us. She said, I really believe this. The things that come into my head uh, are unreal. Yes, it's visual too. Not suicidal thoughts for me, thank God. And then what, whatever you were saying at one point, she said, that sounds like me. So I know that people can relate to this. I can relate to this. And so many people that I work with, I know can relate to this as well. So thank you so much for this and the work that you're doing in the world, David. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. Okay. Bye everyone. And don't forget, share this with someone who needs it. If you know someone that needs to hear this, please share it with them. All right. Bye.